Welcome to Searching for Answers. We keep on searching, and we're glad you're searching along with us in this program where we dig into the Word of God and ask ourselves what it meant when it was originally written and what it means for us today. Our discussants this time include Dr. William Johnson, New Testament scholar who has spent particular energy in his life working on the epistle to the Hebrews. Also, Pastor Rochelle Webster on the pastoral staff of the Redlands uh, uh, SDA Church uh, in pastoral ministry, particularly to families. Uh, Dr. Leo Ranzelin, a New Testament scholar here at Loma, Lin Loma Linda University and uh, the associate dean of the School of Religion here. My name is John Jones in La Sierra University, and we are working our way through that famous faith chapter, looking at those heroes, those ordinary people who did extraordinary things in faith. Grab your Bibles, uh, line them up, <laughs> and uh, compare them as we read, and we will continue our conversation where we left it off last time, chapter 11, the epistle to the Hebrews, and we'll review a little bit that paragraph, verses 13 through 15. Rochelle, you had read that through for us, but read it again and get us back into it, if you will. Sure. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Mm. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Mm. The contrast has always been there throughout this entire book. Earthly, heavenly, earthly, heavenly. Mm -hmm. It's bridged by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes. But now, the heroes of faith contribute to that bridging because they participate in that pilgrimage mm. that's moving from one realm to another. And it says, you know, uh, if they had wanted to, they could have, you know, clung to the land they left behind. Mm -hmm. If they wanted to turn their backs on God, so to speak, this is my interpretation, God would have given them permission to do that. They were not compelled. The point is, they were indeed motivated by their faith. Right. And so the faith theme never is far from sight as we work mm -hmm. our way through it. Uh, Rochelle, you've read that. Now, anything else for, from your perspective that you would like to uh, bring out in our conversation at all? Hmm. God wasn't ashamed. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I find the, um, the did not receive the things promised, welcomed them from a distance piece intriguing, and I think it's very rich. And then also the strangers, strangers in a land. Mm -hmm. um, I, that, how, how deeply connected. It's interesting because there's deep connections with the land in the, mm -hmm. in, in the Israelites tradition, right? It's very deeply connected to the land. And yet still the sense of, the sense of stranger or there's two threads mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This promise of the land and, 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 and uh, such a strong connection that there's still tension there today, right? Because mm. of the land, mm. because of that mm. place that mm. you need to be in. And yet, and yet strangers and longing and not yet and insufficient. Those are interesting threads. Mm. Something still held in abeyance, isn't mm -hmm. it? There's still yeah. that longing, still... A higher vision, yeah, something. Yeah, Bill, what do you Some think? Some of these words just speak to me, and I think they speak to people over the generations. I'm thinking of um, that verse 16. Mm. Now they desire a better mm. heavenly country. Mm. This world has wonderful, you know, has wonderful qualities. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful world yeah. and an ugly world. It's a strange world. Mm -hmm. It's good and it's bad. It's beautiful and it's ugly. And um, we belong in this world, you know, and yet 
the world is not what we know it ought to be. And so there's that longing of the human heart. They desire a better, a heavenly country, you know. So much that's messed up here. We, we go, we have loss of friends. Good night, the last couple of months are probably five friends yeah. have gone, mm. you know. It's terrible. Mm. But that's this world that we're in. Mm. Mm. It's beautiful and it's tragic. It's wonderful. It's almost too much to bear. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So you have it here, you know. Mm. Um, I would say this is a very much a New Testament perspective on the land. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Old Testament, as Rochelle brought out so well, you know, the the the, the actual land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here in the New Testament has gone beyond that mm. okay. to a better land, a better country. Mm. Every time I read this, I begin to hear now the violins <laughs> yeah. and the French horns. There's something aching. There's something yeah. yearning about oh, this, oh, isn't poignant. there? It's poignant, yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I wish, mm, I think it's very hard for us moderns and postmoderns, both, you know, to, to really get that sense of summons beyond yeah. this realm in which we live our lives yeah. somehow. I was reflecting on the, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Yeah. That's, that he has prepared a city for them I've, I've been curious about where's, the, it feels like it's a summation of this beautiful, I mean, the, the end of this beautiful paragraph. And so there's an emotional punch there. There's something deeply evocative. Yeah. And yet I've sometimes read it and been like, what is it? What, what is the emotional appeal at that very end of the fact that God has made a city? And I think that it's more than just I just imagine, I imagine Abraham, right, mm -hmm. who was familiar with cities that was along the rivers that was stable and known, and to leave the comfort of the river where there's life in the desert and to, to go off into this completely new direction where cities might have been rumored, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you're crossing mm -hmm. the desert mm -hmm. and you have no map and you have no way and you're headed towards a city mm -hmm. that is promised, a land that is promised and is promised to be people and cities and, and, and there will be something there for you, right? And he had to make that journey of, of an unknown land but with this assurance that God was ahead, I would make it. In, so he's going through an inhospitable place with an assurance that at the end of it, God has made something hospitable. And I think that that echo um, is loud here, is that we are going through an inhospitable place at times with an assurance that God is in front of us and has made something hospitable. Mm -hmm. And that language of city um, is... Is connected for me, and then and then you know, looking ahead to Revelation and the and the new New Jerusalem language there, and, and the city language is, is beautiful for me. So that that was just an interesting allusion to what would it have been like for Abraham to leave the securities of cities with this concept of there's a city mm -hmm. waiting for me. You know, still today you fly over the the deserts in, in between. And you look out the airplane window and it looks like an ocean, only it's brown, There's not nothing blue. There. I wonder how nothing humans, there. How do humans survive? Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the historians who document uh, the westward migration in our country often remark on what it meant to take those wagon trains through very inhospitable country mm -hmm. yeah. with the promise of the greenness of Oregon mm -hmm. and California, mm -hmm. which they had not seen, but right. were only going by reports. So, you know, there are resonances within our own national consciousness yeah. as a people here. John, uh, there's so many evocative ideas here. Yeah. Uh, one that especially comes to mind just now is this... Um, 
for the country, city, yeah. dichotomy. Yeah. 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 You know, often uh, um, Christians, and Adventists in particular, have said, you know, it'll be back to Eden, Eden restored. Well, not according to this, okay. We may have started out in a garden, but we end up in a city, mm -hmm. which is where Revelation comes down. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. isn't it interesting? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because even this book, before we even get to the apocalypse at the, at the end of our, what we call our New Testament, summons us beyond a city toward a city. Yes. <laughs> yeah. exactly. We are called outside of a particular city yeah. because we're looking, because we here we have no lasting city, but we're looking for a city that is yes, yet to come. Yes, we're looking for cities. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So now the language of polis, of city, is beginning to crop up. Mm -hmm. And we will keep bumping into it now as we go on through these last few chapters. Mm -hmm. That's evocative, isn't it? What do you think, Leo? If I, one of the things that, I try, that I've tried to do when I've read through this homily with care, yeah. as, you've, as you've heard me say, is to reconstruct the, the social mm. historical setting yeah. and uh, try to ascertain what these folks are going through. And as we've said, a great deal of hardship and suffering mm. and persecution, mm. loss of property, being publicly humiliated, spiritual discouragement. So as I've thought of that, as I read through this, letter or homily, it's just incredible to me how beautifully this homiletician mm. responds to that social setting. Mm -hmm, As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, I cannot imagine it being done better, particularly given the fact that it's, I think, a Jewish Christian audience. Mm. And so here's my point in saying that, that this, and, and here we see it in 13 through 16, the core thing that he wants to get through here is that we need to have this identity. This is not our home. We're strangers, mm -hmm. aliens, exiles on this planet Earth, making this pilgrimage, this journey to the heavenly country, the heavenly city, with this expectation of the soon coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants to imprint upon this audience and the hardship and suffering that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And so I get that. And it's beautifully crafted and done. What about those of us that live in the West mm. that are not necessarily going through mm. the kind of life that mm. this audience is going through? Is this homiletical medicine, if you will, as relevant to us as it would be for folks in other parts of the world? Mm -hmm. Could it be that for us in the West who are really kind of going through what this audience is going through, mm -hmm. texts like Luke Acts that suggest a greater degree of involvement and yeah. In, in planet Earth, a commitment to social justice and to make the world a better place. Those texts resonate with us more so than, than these. Two. Than the texts of estrangement from right. this world. Yeah, uh, right. Mm. Because mm. I, I, I just don't find myself... <laughs> Resonating quite right. a bit. <laughs> yeah. It sounds wonderful, right? Yes. And it is yes. wonderful. And we can identify but with it in a how way. How many of us but really have as our core, yeah. one of our core identities that we're aliens and strangers? Mm -hmm. This is not our home. Hmm? Well, I think yeah. we know it. Um, we have a, a times of crisis in, a, in life. Yeah. When we know that, you know, there's got to be something Right. More than this. Well, and we all face those moments. Mm -hmm. and, and they're real. Absolutely, and they're, they're real. perhaps the most intense moments mm -hmm. in our lives. Okay. So, yeah, even in the West, where we have it so good in so many ways, mm -hmm. we still suffer, we still lose loved ones. Yeah. We have accidents, we have cancer. You know, it's mm -hmm. real. This is our mm -hmm. life. So... There's got to be a better life than this. Mm. Are we... Do, is our struggle sometimes the question of whether or not we are embarrassed or uh, dismayed or ashamed mm -hmm. uh, to be... Uh, to be called God's children or to call God our God. Mm -hmm. Here, it's flipped over the other way. Mm -hmm. 
The point is not merely that we should be impressed with these people. God is impressed with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that something? In verse 16, God is not abashed or ashamed right. yeah. Yeah. to be called their God. Right. Well, if that's the case, we should really be impressed with these people. Right? Yep. And again, it's not because they are superhuman. They are very human. They have all of the weaknesses that we all do. And yet God is not ashamed of them. Yes, don't, you, don't you hear yeah. echoes here of a suffering community? Right. A minority yeah. group oh, yes. in the middle of a, yes. of a hostile environment mm -hmm. of society, mm -hmm. you know, mocking them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And some of them feeling ashamed, you know, almost don't want to let their faith, their religion come out. God is not ashamed mm -hmm. right. of his people. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So, therefore, we should not be ashamed yeah. of God. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting mm -hmm. expression. Yeah, God it, yeah I, I, I know of nothing of the sort, at least in the New Testament. No, oh, I don't yeah. either. Right. No, it, mm -hmm. It's just fascinating. And, and so the question for me, when, as we speak about this, the, the people that he's chosen, their experiences mm. in different social settings, mm. has he selected those folks because they are particularly relevant to what his audience is going through? Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to see in verse 35 where he speaks of others being tortured, yeah. not accepting release. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's rough stuff, mm. right? Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Does he bring that in? Because it may well be that some folks are, are going through that I very experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have or they're going to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just, I've just been, I got stuck on 14, the, like the evocative longing yeah. of 14. I just, I, I'm sorry, I went into a little space there because, mm -hmm. <laughs> because people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Yeah. Like that, boy, that, I don't know if anyone's ever felt like you don't, they, maybe, maybe those of us, the listeners or viewers who've traveled a lot um, and felt like you don't have one place to call your home or, mm -hmm. or, or people, I mean, we just had some devastating fires and, and mm -hmm. hurricanes and getting displaced and having no place to call your home. Like that, that primal need for, right. for security and home and roots, roots mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. safety, right? And mm -hmm. people who say such things people who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. I just, I don't, I, I have nothing more to say other than that spoke to me in terms of just an, in an emotional um, longing, like it touched yeah. that. And how many people, how many people can resonate with this? I think there are a lot. Yeah. We are looking for a country of our own. And then what this author does says, you know, in the Old Testament, there was a country, mm. um, and here it was. But, but now, the actual place will be in heaven. Yeah. And that is still to come, and we don't need to be deeply discouraged that the place that we had fixated on at home isn't looking, on earth, isn't looking like we wished it would. Yeah. So the promise of the land is not a promise of a mundane, that is to say, this worldly land. Mm -hmm. it's, of a, it's of a higher land. It's well, it really was a promise of this land. Originally so. And so but, yeah. maybe there's, maybe there's yeah. this thing not seen again. Maybe yeah. there's this kind of a, sh uh, a glimpse of, maybe uh -huh. it refers to what we, they did not receive the things promised. They saw them and welcomed yeah. them from a distance. So, yeah. Yeah. so the land that they were promised might have been a, a foretaste of a greater promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something, yeah, something better, something better. <laughs> that theme that we've seen throughout this writing it now comes to the, to the level of the land, doesn't it? Yeah. So, Bill, here we are with Abraham still. Mm -hmm. Now it moves to Abraham and Isaac. Mm -hmm. Do you want to pick that up for us in verse 17 and down through 22? Yeah. yeah. By faith, Abraham when he was tested, 
offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which she also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Yeah. It seems to me <laughs> these are all, you know, looking forward. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. you know, there's a future, mm-hmm. which is where 11.1 took us right from the beginning, okay? Things hoped for, title deed to things hoped for, evidence mm-hmm. of things not seen. So the future is faith guarantees the future. I think that's what he's driving at over and over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, um, the pace quickens generation by generation now. Isaac, Jacob, Esau, uh-huh. yeah, Joseph. Um, so can I ask a yeah. question that my students invariably ask? How can one have this kind of a faith? How do you get there? How do you have this kind of confidence in the unseen, hoped for future? It just does not seem real to them. Yeah. And they're not alone, I would say. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the questions that I think all of us uh, I, I wish that uh, all of our viewers could uh, join the circle mm. in a live conversation here because I think it's one of the most pertinent questions that emerges from this text. Mm-hmm. It's, it's tempting to say, despite all of the hardships and the imprisonment and the suffering, yeah. maybe it was easier to do that mm-hmm. in those days because they had a kind of mental predisposition mm-hmm. or a kind of a mythic structure or right. something going on right. that at least they could it, it could, it could click for them yeah. in a way. We, we wrestle without the torture and the imprisonment. We still wrestle with we that. We live in a scientific we? world we do. in which we only believe that which we can empir- yeah. empirically verify. Yeah. That's the world I live in. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so he's speaking of of, of an alternate life and perspective. Of which the the evidence is our faith. (laughs) So it feels to us like a closed circle in a way, doesn't it? How do we break into that circle? How do we get there? And so oh oh, ye of little faith, that I I just want to live and embrace this perspective and lifestyle. Mm. It sounds so hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Since you bring up Jesus, you know. But he said, if you only had faith, faith like a little mustard seed, faith, you'd move mountains. You know, it's, it that's, takes us in another direction. But you know, yeah. I think of this character, Abraham, so interesting. Mm. You know, his life and his faith, it's not a straight line at all. It's mm-hmm. an up and down. <laughs> but the yes, trend sir. is upward. Right. The yeah. trend is upward. The graph goes up. Mm-hmm even though it dips at times. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he doesn't have faith in um, when he's... When he was down in Egypt. Egypt doesn't have faith when <laughs> yeah. he comes back, mm-hmm. you know, makes the same mistake. Doesn't have faith that he's actually, Sarah's actually going to uh, bring, bring forth a son. But yet, you know, late in life, you know, you have the, this incredible experience of Mount Moriah, yeah. as referred to. Yeah. But that's late in the journey. Mm. Okay. He'd yeah. been through a lot. He knew his God, and uh, he trusted God. And he came to trust God in an incredible measure. Mm. It boggles my mind. He, precisely. And therefore, Leo, these agents come to make or break situations, uh-huh. don't they? I mean, I mean, they were, we, we read earlier that if they wanted, they, verse 15, they could have gone back. They could have come back. They, somehow, 
somehow faith is the product of, of periodic make or break moments, sometimes small, mm -hmm. yeah. sometimes big. We today in this world who, who don't resonate so readily to the other world, nonetheless have these little decision points. Maybe the secret of this faith is to pay attention to those small decisions that we do have to make day by day. Um, still, that pertains to our lives, what we choose to uh, look at online or whatever, you know, how, how we behave toward people with whom we share the freeway, uh, yeah. all of that, you know. <laughs> but that somehow the cumulative effect builds us. Abraham needed a lifetime to get there. Maybe our undergrads, even grad students, mm -hmm. Uh, would benefit from a reminder that there are still years ahead. Mm -hmm. Be patient with yourself as God is patient with you. That sounds a little trite, but it may be that it's the best we have to offer yeah. in this day, day and age, mm -hmm. in our circumstances today. John, I have to say yeah. that, you know, uh, I've come across people, and I'm sure we all have, you know, who have walked with God. Their life hasn't been perfect, you know, in terms yeah. of Far from it. Yeah. Maybe make major mistakes along the way, but they have developed such a relationship with God. And you see them, you know, at the end of a long and full and beautiful life. And they are wonderful people. You know. They really reflect the character of God. Mm -hmm. you know. mm. How did they get there? <laughs> they didn't have a Mount Moriah. But it's what you were saying. Day by day, yeah. step by step, yeah. trusting God in little things and in big. Trusting God in the little things yeah. prepares us to trust God in yeah. the so-called big things. Yeah. <laughs> so Hebrews can speak of the incarnation, not merely of, of, of God sharing God's self with us, but of God learning something, so to speak, at least in the form of Jesus, about the human condition. There's mysteries there that we do not understand. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there's something about being human that can be lived in ways that God is not ashamed to call us his people. Right. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Rochelle, as we tick down the final seconds here, you get the last word. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... I think that this question of faith and that's, that means sometimes believing when, when things are out of control, taking a step in faith, and it also sometimes means letting go, mm -hmm. even in opportunities mm -hmm. where you could hold on, sometimes saying, God, God, I'm going to give this to you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this ability to say every step, I will yeah. grow and learn in you. And here's where faith becomes trust, finally. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that some more next time on Searching for Answers. <laughs>